We are back once again with Erica Brown. She is the publisher and editor of The Cricket, coming to us from her office in beautiful downtown Manchester by the sea. Hello, Erica. Hey, Corey. <laughs> You're dry. That's good to see. Oh, my God. I'm dry, but I'm freezing, right? Is, yeah. You're either like wet or you're freezing in the ice and the snow. I mean, it's I been know. such a crazy, crazy January, right? It has. Yep. All over the place. <laughs> All well, we're finally getting focus, uh, more focus now on uh, the latest developments with the NBA task force and, uh, you know, these next steps, how things are, are, are unfolding here. Can you update us yeah. on that? We're, um, yes, we're, uh, uh, it's the MBTA uh, overlay district. It's that 40A state mandate uh, to any uh, community that is services. I mean, in, in case you've been living under a rock, mm. <laughs> there are, you know, um, you know, 150 or so. Uh, communities in, in the state of Massachusetts that have to comply before the end of this calendar year with a mandate by the state to create um, a zone within a certain half a mile of an MBTA station, a commuter rail station uh, that's a state resource. So they say in return, you have to provide the ability for higher density housing by right. It's a, it's a very controversial thing. Uh, however, um, Manchester, uh, and, and it affects all of the, uh, every single community on Cape Ann. So this is, this is a big issue. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of, um, pain associated with it. Mm. So there's going to be a town meeting vote before the end of the year. That's really what they're driving against. Well, Manchester has had a task force now that's been operational since I believe last September, last August. Uh, it's kind of an outgrowth of the planning board. Uh, it's chaired by uh, Chris Olney, who's a member of the planning board. There's also Susan Philbrick, who's also on the planning board. But it also encompasses a lot of other people. Historic district, um, you know, they're, you know, conservation, you know, edit, uh, citizens at large. So it's a, it's a good task force. And they kind of been taking a lot of guff for not really getting kicking into action sooner. But I got to say, a couple of weeks ago, they sort of brought forth all the result of their work. And it's clear they almost boomeranged and leap, leapfrogged ahead of other communities now. They're in really good shape. Uh, they hired a, um, a, uh, a consultant, um, Ennis. Uh, I, I believe that's how she pronounces her name. I think it's Emily Ennis. Uh, and the first, there's two big questions that any community wants to know, and Manchester is definitely one of them. They want to know, what are we talking about in my community? Not just a general idea, but what are you really talking about? Get specific. Tell me whether my neighborhood's going to be in it or not. And then the other thing they want to know, and this is the second thing that they don't know yet, is very, very important because it's how far are we from where we are right now to complying anyway? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, in other words, this isn't something, it's not a mandate to build housing. A lot of people like to say that. Uh, we talk about that a lot, about how there's a lot of fear mongering that says, we're going to have, we're going to be like Grand Tool Street. And the truth is, it's not a mandate to build. It's a mandate to allow as a right to build. Now, that's a, actually a very meaningful distinction. And I'll tell you why. You can have a three family legally in Manchester in, in many parts of Manchester. We, we don't have a bunch of three families around Manchester. So even though you can by right do it, doesn't mean people are doing it. <laughs> let's remember that. So anyway, let's get down to business. They found that for Manchester, according to this report, what we're looking at is we're looking at, um, you know, the required numbers of acres are about 39 acres. That's what we're talking about. And by right, according to this mandate, 15 units per acre. So it really translates to 585 units that could be um, allowed, basically. Um, and what they found out was, or what they're recommending, is they looked at the 11 areas in town that the task force had uh, kind of identified as, as practical. Um, they cut out five of them. They're considering maybe one or two more. So we're really talking about like maybe seven, eight kind of areas. They got specific. 15.6 uh, acres have to be within that half a mile because the state basically says, listen, you don't have to do it all within the, the, the uh, you can have 60% of it can be outside of that half mile radius. So that gets rid of the whole brand tool street argument, by the way, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so 
if for Manchester, it's 15.6 acres is within that half mile district and then 23 acres is going to be outside of it. Now, what are some of the examples of some of them that's within the half mile? One that's interesting, Newport Park. I was waiting for that. That is already senior housing. That already has that density. That already is something that the Manchester Affordable Housing Trust is actively trying to expand, right? So they included that. Very, very smart. A lot of Pine Street areas have been identified. Um, there have been Sarah Mellish, who is uh, on the board. She's actually the chairman of the ZBA and the chairman of the Finance Committee. And she's a member of the task force. Very busy lady. Mm -hmm. She actually recommended a new area that would be within the village the, around the Ma Memorial School area between Memorial School and the old 1606, I think it's 1606 uh, cemetery, yeah. the ancient cemetery. Mm -hmm. So kind of that whole area. Um, and then there are some outside areas that would be examples would be um, over by Magnolia, up by your old stomping grounds where you grew up. Yeah, uh, you kind stay of the away Raymond, from it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Raymond Street area, kind of Summer Street around Raymond Street, kind of that part of town. Um, another part of town, not surprisingly, the, the LCD, the Limited Commercial District, um, although it would be on the cell signaling side. So we're talking about kind of the family medicine uh, area, the place where Black Earth Compost is right now, the Manchester Athletic Club, that area. Um, that's not surprising because um, the limited commercial district was identified by the town, uh, the town's own master plan as being, you know, an area for growth, including housing. So that's not a surprise. Um, and it's also right off of 128, which is really kind of easy and, you know, you don't have traffic running through town all the mm -hmm. time. It, it, it relieves the pressure. So there you go. It's off and running. So I guess the next step really is to say, okay, how many units in these areas do we already allow under our current zoning without a change? And that'll be the delta between where we are now and what we do, what we need to get to the 585 units because these aren't 585 new potential units because a portion of that 585 units already is already allowed exists, right? right yeah exactly that that it or the allowance has already existed so you need to kind of back those out and that's where you're going to see where you are and i think when you when you look at it that way it lets out a lot of the heat out of the balloon or out of the discussion because there are people saying 585 units that's terrible we're going to be like grand tool street it's not really like that for two very important reasons they're about to go there so i think they're on track for like having um maybe voters weigh in on this as early as the annual town meeting in april or may um, if they're on track, um, but that they have until the end of the year. So you have two bites at the apple. Um, it's interesting to, it'll be interesting to see in the next couple of um, months in Manchester and Essex, of course, they don't need to do anything really because they already comply. And then uh, in Gloucester, I know that um, there's a real appetite for trying to dimensionalize this within the framework of young people wanting to start out in their lives and needing sort of housing that is more um, reasonable, that they're not priced out of, sort of smaller format housing. Um, so they're trying to kind of talk about it from that perspective. And then of course, senior housing is a total no brainer. Everyone gets it, everyone understands it. Um, so they understand that the need for seniors to downsize and therefore have something to live in, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not subsidized low income housing. Do you need that kind of in between? So there you go, that was, uh, that was a very long way of long winded sort of update, but but it was deserves it because it was an important one actually that's a it was a big step for that task force, I think that was really good yeah. and detailed and Jeff Pope did a great job covering it so. Nice. And I'm glad and, and we know the how successful the, the density walk was just as far as from a communication standpoint. It's a good thing they weren't doing that during the flooding, though. <laughs> Was that... And then also well, the flooding, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Since we last talked, when we last talked, the flooding was in. Then we had more flooding and then freezing and snow. I mean, it's it's kind of like this weird roller coaster yeah. that really showed the difference, like what life is going to be like if we have sea level rise. I mean, mm -hmm. th there was an instant, like somebody was telling me that the um, the wind, you know how the wind was so prominent in this, these storms? Yeah. Apparently the wind was going the opposite of what a typical wind for a nor'easter does. 
So I don't know what direction a nor'easter. I mean, you'd, you'd think that it would be northeast, but that that's the direction, which I From think the northeast, that's right? Because usually a, a, the a, a precept of, to issues out of sea is when it comes from the southwest. And then you know the weather's about to change. Yes, right? yes. And then you so wear I your, sou your southwester hat you have on? Surprise. Yes, the, that's that. The, the, I guess the weather, wind was going in a different direction, mm -hmm. and that actually aggravated the flooding. And that was a kind of a factor for the flooding, apparently. I, yeah, and I, know. I don't know if it was coming from the southeast because, you know, the Cape always gets battered, right? The Cape and the islands and then usually Cape Ann, especially like Manchester, Magnolia, the eastern point, um, usually take a beating too that way because we're facing, like I know like Magnolia Beach faces south, essentially. Magnolia and so does Manchester. Right. So. And Manchester basically, downtown Manchester faces south. Mm -hmm. Singing Beach faces south. White Beach faces south. Kettle Cove South. Yeah. So those are all um, south facing. That's exactly right. So a lot of the areas of the flooding, I mean, the flooding we saw, we were talking about this before, there were parking lots that made like the flooded, the parking lot behind Town Hall was completely flooded and the American Legion was an island, an island. And the, Ma the Masonic Hall was waterfront which is just wild to think of in Manchester. I, I the causeway was flooded twice, uh, right, in Essex. So we've got these sort of things that are coming up. With the task force, not to go back to it, but with the task force, one of the areas that was identified um, that was pretty critical was Elm Street. Guess what? Elm Street was completely flooded. It was that Elm Street, uh, you know, Powderhouse Lane apartments. They mm. were, there was waterfront, there was water like right up to the building. That's amazing to think about. And then, of course, behind across, you know, Sawmill Brook, um, you know, Friend Street, uh, you know, School Street, that whole back area uh, where the fire department is, that was all really swollen, swollen and flooded. So you can see these areas that are within a half a mile of the uh, the MBTA uh, district is, I know. you know, they may not be buildable, but that's irrelevant, actually, as it relates, I think, to the compliance issue. Like we can say, listen, this is uh, buildable and that doesn't mean it's gonna be buildable in the future. So, you know. Well, and what's amazing to think of too is, imagine if the ground had been frozen for the last month and there was nowhere for the water to go initially. I mean, that, I mean it would have been twice as bad. So yeah, crazy stuff. Think about that. Anyway. All right, great stuff all around, Erica. Uh, we wanna um, pass along a note about um, George Matthews. Yeah, some occasionally you and I will I'll, I'll point out with you like people who have passed on that are kind of notable and George Matthews is definitely one of them. He's originally I think he was born in East Boston so he's not sort of originally from Manchester but he has been in Manchester forever. Uh, for a really, really long time very much a Manchester guy um, and what an interesting career he's had actually I would encourage people to read his obituary George Matthews. Uh, he was. I remember meeting him in the 80s um, and he was working with Mikhail Gorbachev. He was a co-founder with Gorbachev, the former president and, and, and the, the, of, of Russia who was responsible with Ronald Reagan of bringing, you know, bring down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, remember that, you know, oh, yeah. line from Ronald Reagan. And, and then they became uh, friends, um, there was a friendship there. Well, George Matthews was also friends with Mikhail Gorbachev and was a co-founder with him of the Gorbachev Foundation of North America. Um, and so that's how I kind of met him. Um, and then he was a very, very important um, at, with Northeastern University. He was the chairman of the board of directors for a long time. He was a real believer. And I believe he oversaw the arena, the athletic arena, which was called the Boston Arena when it was uh, taken over. And, and it's called the George and Hope Matthews uh, Sports Arena. That's uh, right, after yeah. So it's, it's um, he's a really important person who lived a very rich life in terms of just what he was able to touch and accomplish. And I would encourage people to read his obituary. Mm, nicely put, Erica. Okay, great stuff as usual. Uh, let's do this again this time next week. You got it. <laughs>